So did everybody have a chance to look at the little seven minute video? And what we'll try to do, we'll do a little quiz and uh, that material, you know, use that seven minute video, that potentially part of the lecture and part of the exam. So we'll do a little eye clicker and we'll kind of go through the phylogram and the phylogeny and how those traits changed. And the other thing I, is I've been talking to the Norton reps, those are the publishers in terms of the stuff they have in the course packs. So in Moodle, right, you're seeing all the various chapters so I think they have, some, they have some good things in there. One of those is oftentimes I may show the video, but I'd watch each of the videos that they have in each of, they don't have them in all the chapters, but certain numbers of within the chapters they have videos. They also have the flashcards, and they also have the quizzes. So my big fear was, oh, those quizzes are exactly what are in my test bank, right? And they assured me they're a little bit different. But I think if, as you go, you know, if you want to take those quizzes and do those, they might help you, and again, if it's on material that I haven't covered in lecture, I wouldn't worry too much about those questions, but if you see questions in each chapter on the quizzes, you know, it might help you just in terms of preparing for the exam and get, you know, I, oftentimes I'll pull questions from the test bank, not too many, but some, but they'll be kind of similar, so I think it might be helpful if you do that. So my question is, has anybody tried to do, take a quiz? What happens? Okay, so there's some fill-ins in there. I, I've seen a bunch of multiple choice, too. Does it tell you also, you know, whether you got the question right or wrong? Okay. Why don't you go in and see, see what you find? Because when I go in and look at it, I can hit something, and, it, and I, maybe it's just from my instructor's viewpoint. I don't have the, so if you wouldn't mind, somebody, somebody try that out and then just email me and make sure that you're actually able to take the quizzes, get an assessment of, no, that's wrong, why, and all, it's hopefully, it's, do you know? No, there are no due dates, so I'm not requiring the quizzes, it's not part of your grade or anything like that, so, okay. Okay? <laughs> what? Oh, I almost ran into, okay, okay. So, um, so I think the, the, the flashcards and the quizzes and some of the videos might be helpful, so I try to use those materials as you, if you can. Okay. So, uh, how many of you watch, don't you want, I know you all raise your hand. How many watch the seven minute video? Okay, are you ready for the question? And of course, you know, if you didn't watch it, give it a try and we'll go through it. Okay. So, let me get it set up and then I'll pull up the question. So, it's based on looking at the evolution of these toxins and advanced delivery systems in some pretty advanced, an advanced group of snakes, including vipers and a bunch of other things, so. <clears throat> Whoop, that's a little big. Can you read that? Can you read that? Let's try 100. Okay. The question is, in the phylogeny of advanced snakes, which of the following was true? A, advanced venom delivery systems originated once. B, advanced venom delivery systems originated prior to specialized dentition. That is, they, it arose earlier in the tree. C, there was a single origin of three FTX toxin and presumably non-toxic snakes within this clade or group were discovered to be toxic. And D, there were three independent origins of three FTX toxin associated always with the advanced delivery systems. So I think if you didn't watch the video, this will be kind of difficult, but give it a shot. I usually, you can, I can eliminate two of them if I didn't even watch the video. Okay. Ready? Oh, why does it do that? Okay. <clears throat> and we'll do a little one later in case somebody comes late. <clears throat> Do 
other, do a lot of you have this? No? So, yeah. I've had it for six days, so. <coughs> okay, it looks like it's slowing down. Is everybody in? And I will post these PDFs. I'll try to create a folder for like clicker questions so you have access to these. Okay, I'm gonna, anybody else? You'll have another chance to get in. Oh, I didn't want to see that. Wait, what happened? Oh, do I stop here? Huh? Okay, what was the answer? Everybody voted for C? Yes, that's a, that was, I think if you, if you watch the video, that's a pretty straightforward. Let's see how everybody did. <sighs> okay, good, okay. So do you like those kinds of videos? Or does it, I, so there's a phenomenon going on in higher education in which, you know, people don't lecture as much, right? And you come in and watch, you watch videos the night before, right? Or whenever you have, and then we just come in and discuss things. Do you like that idea? Okay, we could do a lot more discussion. So usually it's done in kind of smaller classes, but you know, anyway, it's called flipping the classroom. So <laughs> anyway, so everybody did good. Some people had B, let me kind of go through. Um, I'll just quickly go through the. <coughs> okay. Who likes snakes? Okay. They always kind of creep me out growing up, to tell you the truth. I had got to tell you. Okay, but I've overcome that fear. Okay, and these are some pretty uh, pretty toxic ones. So this is a group of snakes. So basically what this shows is, what we're doing is we have this phylogeny, this fairly advanced group of snakes, and you can look at each tick mark represents the putative origin and a common ancestor, deep, you know, as you go through this tree, ranging from the specialized oral secretory glands first, then the specialized dentition, and then you had three presumably independent origins, and this is still debatable to tell you the truth, but at least two independent origins of an advanced delivery system that I showed previously. And the reason it's kind of debatable is, do you really know the relationship between the elapidae and the attractospidity? You really don't, and we're gonna come back to a lot of these things, but as you look at this particular As you look at this particular clade, right, is it, do you, is it resolved what the relationships are among these five groups? What do we call that when it, all these five kind of go back to a single ancestral point? Remember that? That's a polytomy, right? And so that's an example where the relationships are unresolved. You don't know which group is more closely related to one another. So if I were to say, what if you did a phylogeny, you got it better resolved, and these two instead were sister taxa, what would you say how many independent origins would have occurred of that advanced del delivery system in that case? <laughs> There'd be, if those two were sister taxa and went back to the common, they share a more recent common ancestor, then there would be two origins. There would be an origin here and an origin there, but at least two to three independent origins, not just one, okay? The other thing that was really cool is most people thought, oh, these things up in here don't have advanced venom delivery systems. Oh, they must not be toxic, right? Well, what the researchers did, and they're actually finding out a lot more, this rat snake right here, they thought, eh, it doesn't have an advanced, and they found out it had all these really potent toxins. And it's turned out a lot of these other snakes have, they've discovered, had this 3-FTX toxin. And even though they don't have that advanced delivery system, they have teeth and they have a way to inject the venom into prey to immobilize them and then to kill them. Okay, so there are, so this was kind of the, un, un, the new thing that was found is, and again, you don't know necessarily, what if, let me just ask, pose another question. What if all of these 
what if you found out and you went and looked at, you know, I mean, you're talking about thousands of snake species, right? So it hasn't been done. But what if you found out all of these, in fact, have this toxin? What would you say if this tick mark right here is here and it's still true? <clears throat> what argument would you have to make about some of those snake species not having that toxin? <coughs> Could be, but they all, let's say the phylogeny is still true. This is a tough question, don't get me wrong. So let's say this is in fact true. This is the common ancestor to all these snakes, and this is in fact true that the toxin originated in that common ancestor. How would you explain some snakes not being toxic? Huh? Mutations, okay, and what was the mutation leading to? What did it lead to in some of these snakes? The loss of it, right? So you can think about this, and this is not a, you know, you don't have all the thousands of species in this group, right? So we're not looking at it at this level. This is pretty much a family level phylogeny of snakes. There are lots of species within each one of these. So what you could find, and we'll be spending a lot more time on that, maybe these are the this is a genus within this colubridae, right? Maybe that rat, rat snake has it, and most of them have it, but maybe a few of them don't. So there can be the evolutionary loss of traits, and that's fairly common. So that's another thing we can also look at is, as you get a more advanced and a more detailed phylogeny. It may not be, and I'm certainly true it isn't, not all of these snakes have this kind of toxin, and they may have lost it, okay? And what might be the reasons that might occur? Yeah, they don't, maybe they use some other mechanism to capture prey and ingest prey, and they don't need necessarily a, a toxin. And maybe toxins are expensive to produce, right? And all these sorts of things. So a lot of times you have to look at all these, these kinds of features, okay? Okay, any questions about that? And the other thing is we'll be coming back to that. In the previous slides, we kind of looked at how, you know, par what's called parsimony, and we'll be doing a lot of that when we get to reconstructing evolutionary trees, and that'll be something we'll be doing a lot of. And you'll be doing a whole lab on it, too. So any questions about that chapter? we're going to do today, and I think we'll have time towards the end, I'm going to do um, a little problem that I think will be helpful, and I've got some homework. Have I posted that? Okay, I don't think I've posted the homework yet. So there's going to be some homework that you can turn in. It's going to be based on Mendelian genetics, and then what's called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and then models of selection. So it's going to be a series of problems that you'll have to turn in for homework, but they're also going to be very similar kinds of questions on the exam. So I, th hope, I think it'll be helpful for you to do this. So what we're gonna talk today is based in chapter six and looking at transmission genetics and sources of genetic variation. And what we're really trying to do here is we're gonna set the stage for understanding how populations change in the frequencies of genes. And what we're be spending a lot of time is looking at what's called population genetics or how various evolutionary forces like selection, mutation, drift, all these things affect genetic variation within population. Eventually, at the end of the lecture, we're gonna reintroduce you to Mendelian genetics, which I know is always one of your favorite subjects, right? Okay, so, and I've posted on Moodle a very nice link from the Khan Academy on a great video on all of the elements of Mendelian genetics that you would ever want to know much better than I could ever do or that I don't have the time to do it. So if you need a little bit of a refresher course, I'm going to assume some basic knowledge of Mendelian genetics towards the end of this lecture and even probably next lecture. And then we'll be doing some problems based on whether genes are linked or unlinked and what expectations are under trade inheritance. So we'll be talking a lot about that, but the Khan Academy video is fantastic. So. So what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on how does an understanding of how does under, an understanding of how information is translated from DNO, DNA to amino acids and proteins inform us about the evolution of life. What I've really left out there is another key feature of going from DNA to amino acids to protein, and that's phenotype. That's the next. So we'll be talking a lot about this is a very complex 
issue of translation of DNA to phenotype, and it's a very complex problem, and we're just barely going to be touching on the, the, um, the complexity of it. We're also going to primarily focus on how do mutations gener gener generate genetic variation, and how do mutations affect the fitness of organisms. Do you know what fitness is? Did you talk about that in biodiversity as a concept? What does it, what's it kind of mean? Yeah, it's basically, in general, what is, the, what is the relative ability of a genotype or a phenotype in terms of their reproductive output? So it's always relative to, is one genotype reproducing at a higher rate or producing more offspring than another, or is it one phenotype producing more offspring and those sorts of things? There are also, survivorship is an important component of how often, how much individuals can reproduce and all these sorts of things. So we'll be looking a lot at how mutations affect survival and or reproduction and um, those sorts of things. And we'll be focusing in primarily, are most mutations beneficial, neutral, or deleterious? I hate to use all this kind of language, but deleterious means bad or negative, okay? Has a negative effect. So we'll be talking about various kinds of mutations. And when we talk about deleterious or negative or detrimental, we're basically talking about mutations that re reproduce reproduction and or survivorship. And uh, this is kind of an important area. One of the things we kind of need to understand a little bit, I'm not going to go through all the details, but there was a lot of during, uh, before Mendel kind of got all this together, is how traits were inherited. There was one model called blending inheritance. You're, I'm not going to test you on this. And then there's the particulate inheritance, which is based on Mendel's views on his stuff. And he got really lucky that he looked at traits that had this. And of course, he had to fudge the numbers a little bit to get it exactly to three to one or one to one. I shouldn't say that, should I? Well, I mean, it's like, you know, do you think out of a thousand individuals that you try to phenotype from a cross, right, there can be a lot of random stochastic events that can lead to not all thousands of those, the thousand of those surviving, right, to get to the phenotype. So he didn't always get three to one, but he got fairly close. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that. So when we look at particulate inheritance, what are these things up here and what are those things right there? Well, these are red flowers and white flowers. That's what we would call the phenotype, right? It's the actual physical representation, in some sense, of the genotype. What are these things? These are the genotypes. So big R, big R, small r, small r. What is each one of those? Those are alleles. So here we have a case where a single trait, two alleles, right? A, a single locus or gene. And um, you cross those two, and what do you get? Do not, do not do a Punnett square on this. I'm, I'm imploring you. I'm going to try to break you of that habit, although we do it in lab. I've never gotten them to change it. Do you really need to do a Punnett square on this? This individual produces one kind of allele, right, through meiosis, the reduction process from diploidy to haploidy, right? I'm not going to ask you to remember all the phases of meiosis and tell me what happens in each. I could care less about that, right? I'm interested in the process, right, and what effect it has on genetic variability. So obviously, that produces one, one haploid gamete, big R. This produces another haploid gamete, small r. You fuse those to restore diploidy. What do you get? All pink individuals. Okay. And what is their genotype, all of them? They're going to be big R, small r, and we call that when you have combinations of two different alleles at a particular gene or locus, heterozygous, okay. And why is it pink? Blend of the two colors, right? And so this is, an, this would be a case of, is this a case of Complete dominance, where one allele completely dominates the expression of the other allele in the phenotype. This is incomplete dominance, co-dominance, partial dominance, whatever you want to call it. Doesn't really matter. So in fact, what you get in the heterozygotes is an intermediate phenotype between the two. And that isn't always the case, and most of the time we look at cases of complete dominance. And then when you do this, um, obviously, you get what, when you, cross those two individuals in this F1 to produce F2s, you get one quarter red, half our intermediates are pinks, and one quarter whites, okay? 
And I'll, we're going to be going through an example, actually, two loci, two genes towards the end of class, hopefully if I get to it. And we're, but you probably feel more comfortable doing a Punnett square. In fact, what I would argue is you should be doing what are called line diagrams or line paths, because it turns out if you have three or more traits, you can't do a Punnett square. So you have to have, but when you get to genetics, that's when you'll start doing those sorts of problems. But Punnett squares don't allow you to do a whole lot to understand inheritance at m where multiple genes influence a phenotype. Okay. But we'll, um, you, you do it in lab, and that's what you're going to be doing next week, mostly is Mendelian genetics, expectations, looking at chi-squares, are observed and expected, pretty similar to what you would get, assuming the model is right, and uh, some cases where it isn't. So we'll come back to that. Again, what we're going to focus on here, again, I'm not going to ask you, I'm not going to ask you to understand the uh, process um, where tra how transcription occurs, right? But what we really need to understand is how do we move from DNA to messenger RNA to then amino acids and then potentially to proteins and then potentially to phenotypes. So I think it's good to kind of just go through the basic stuff. And I assume you all remember this. If you have DNA, it uncoils, right? You have sort of an RNA polymerase that works on a template strand and not the non-template strand, so you have a double strand. Most of the, the, the transcription, well, it only occurs on one of these, which is the template strand. And again, I'm not too worried. So if you go down here and how RNA synthesis is complementary and anti-parallel to the template strand, so here's the th three prime end. What are each one of these things in here? <laughs> a, T, G, and C. There are four nucleotides, obviously. This is a DNA sequence going from three prime to five, five prime, and then basically new nucleotides are added in this direction. So you get this complementary, you know, A in the template strand is translated into messenger RNA to U, T to A, G to C, C to G, blah, 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 okay? And so you then produce this. Nucleonucleotides are added to the three prime hydroxyl group of the growing RNA. So transcripts and proceeds in that direction. Okay? So that's how basically messenger RNA is produced, right? And we'll be talking a lot. What we're going to be primarily focusing on is what happens to when mutations occur and in, sometimes in this transcription process. Here is, do you know what that is? That's translation, right? Okay. So you've basically got this, you know, messenger RNA that's, you know, then it goes to the ribosome. I don't care. I'm not going to ask you any about these details. I could care less. Well, I kind of care, but not for this class. Okay. So you then got this, you know, mess this stuff right here. And then you get this sort of, you know, process by which the proteins are produced through this chain. And it's done, what you'll notice is, how are these things arranged in this growing chain? What, how are the nucleotides grouped? You notice they're kind of in triplets, aren't they? Right? <coughs> so here's the, here's the messenger RNA that translated, that got attached to the ribosome. And then now you're translating that into potentially then a growing polypeptide chain of amino acids. <clears throat> Those amino acids are based on this triplet of these nucleotide sequences. And do you remember what that's called? A triplet of DNA sequence? Co the codons, okay? And each one of these things, this particular set, Obviously, these are all the same, right? So they're actually producing the same kind of uh, amino acid, right? It, it's AGC, AGC, AGC. So it's a repeat of that, co those triplets, of those codons. And you grow that thing, and you produce, basically, uh, this growing polypep polypeptide chain of amino acids through this translation process. So that's just a real refresher. Here's the key thing that I'm kind of interested in, most, what most evolutionary biologists are interested in, and we're not really going to talk about why that redundancy has occurred, <coughs> but we're going to focus in a little bit on the redundancy of the genetic code is really a key to understanding how, understanding the effects of mutations on fitness. And what I want you to do, I want you to memorize this entire thing. 
and tell me what, how glycine is produced, how every one of those is produced. No? Okay. I hope no one ever makes you do that. I've heard of people doing that, and that's, that's just a waste of time, right? That's just pure memorization that, to me, involves no critical thinking. So you can always look at this. Who cares? Anyway, I shouldn't say that. I hope nobody does that in our <laughs> biology department anymore. <laughs> okay. So let's kind of, what, what do I mean by the genetic code? And when we think about it, <clears throat> how is this, these circles are arranged, right? In the main interior part, you can think about this as the first base pair of that triplet, of the codon, right? So that's in here. You have the four possible states, right? G and this is messenger, I'm sorry, messenger RNA, G-U-A-C. What's out here? That's the potential of the second base pair of the codon. And again, what you have, very simply, are the three possibilities. And then in the outer chain is basically the third base pair of a codon. And it's the translation of those three base pair codons into these amino acids that produce pep these growing po polypeptide chain of amino acids. So what do we mean by the redundancy of it? <clears throat> so let's go here. If you have a G, a U, and then you look at this group, where's the redundancy there? It's in, the redundancy is in the third base pair of the codon, right? You can have a mutation, or let's say the ancestral state is a C at that third base pair of that particular codon, and there's a mutation to a U. There's a change in the DNA, in the R, messenger RNA sequence, right? But is there a change in the amino acid being produced? No, it's, an al it's exactly the same. You can have any one of these base pairs, and it'll produce valine. And so most of the d redundancy in the genetic code occurs at the third base pair, okay? And if I were to ask you, do you think there are a lot of effects on fitness or mutations at the third base pair of a codon, what would be your first inclination? No. There, in fact, is, there's hardly no, if there's, they tend to be what we call neutral, and we'll, we'll tell you what we call them. Okay. Is that always true, depending as you go around this circle? No, you can see a few cases, right, where there's not this fourfold, this, all base pairs are not redundant at the third base pair. So if you have a G and A, and you have a U or a C, you produce aspartic acid. But if you have an A or a G, you produce gluta glutamic acid. So there can be cases where a a mutation at a third base pair, depending on what the base pairs are in the first and second base pair of a messenger RNA, can have an effect. Okay. Here's another case where it's completely redundant. So, and then over here you have case, here's, a, here's another one of the more interesting parts is you can have stop codons. Anybody know what stop codons are? They stop the, they stop the translation, right? As soon as, you know, and it's usually used to shut, truncate enzymes they're done producing, but a lot of times mutations can occur that produce stop codons and we'll show what effects they might have, okay? So again, there's a lot of redundancy in the um, genetic code and we're going to talk about how that affects, how that affect, mutations affect fitness. So this is just kind of another thing that when we look at DNA, this, is, this kind of illustrates all of the things we kind of just talked about. And we're not going to, and there's a, there, there are a lot of things that are going on right now that suggest this is a really simple view and it's in fact wrong, but that's okay. And your book talks about it. So if we go from gene, right, from a DNA sequence level to proteins, and then what's down here below here? So you have red flowers, right? And you have pink flowers, and you have white flowers. What we assume, right, is there's some sort of protein, probably associated with a pigment, in the, you know, that influences the expression or the production of particular kinds of pigments. So we're still not going through the entire chain from DNA to actual phenotype here. So the phenotype is still missing. But what we're looking at here, uh, again, we're not going to worry about what promoters are. But you often have exons, introns, and a sequence of a gene, and introns usually 
don't get transcribed for pre-messenger RNA and basically you cut out these introns and then these all get translated into proteins, okay? So again, a lot of introns are sort of spacer regions that aren't, don't code for anything in terms of proteins and are often are excised or spliced out during transcription, but we're still missing the phenotype. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what I, I've already touched on this a little bit. R is on sort of dominance and incomplete dominance. So here's an example, and we'll be doing, we'll be doing a little exercise pretty soon, and then a little eye clicker question. So here you have two genotypes, right? What do we call this individual? If this is, if this allele is dominant, right? And what, what do we mean by dominant? That is, it masks the expression of the other allele when they're in combination with one another in the heterozygote. So this big R is masking the effect or overproducing, producing enough red pigment to basically produce a red flower. What we say in that particular case is R is completely dominant to small r and produces the exact same kind of phenotype as this homozygote. What do we call that big R, big R, a homozygous dominant? This is the heterozygote. And in the, case, in the case of complete dominance, if you have two copies of this small r gene, we call that the recessive allele or recessive gene. We call that the homozygous recessive. Okay? So this is all, this is just kind of refresher stuff. And here's the case where we just talked about before. We have incomplete dominance and you produce an intermediate expression in the heterozygote. Don't do a Punnett square. And what I'm going to, we're going to spend some time towards the end of the lecture to talk about this, but let's just think about this. <coughs> this is a cross between a heterozygote, right? And a homozygous. And we don't know quite yet until we get to the results whether it's homozygous, whether it's dominance or, you know, but we'll say it's homozygous recessive, right? So what kind of alleles is this individual going to produce? Barring mutation, right? Small t, right? You can put it in two cells, be my guest, waste your time. But it, it, it's fine to do it. And you can do it in lab and all those sorts of things. But if you're doing an exam question, I use this kind of fundamental principle. And we're going to show you an example with two genes where you really, it's much faster to do it this way. What kind of, what's the proportion, assuming normal Mendelian, normal meiosis, right? Segregation, no distortion of segregation. What's the percentage of gametes Say this is a male, this is a female. What's the percentage of sperm that have the big T versus small t? 50-50, half and half, right? Okay, assuming everything's going great and as long as there are no my meiotic uh, <laughs> um, segregation disorders. There are a lot of those that do weird things. But So basically what you get, pretty simply, is if you just cross those two things together, what kind of individuals do you think you're going to get from that kind of cross in terms of the genotype? Big T, small t, right? And small t, small t. Those are the only two genotypes that you're going to get. And that's shown in the Punnett square. So you're expecting 50% to be heterozygous and 50% to be homozygous recessive, right? So this is, this is, a, a, this is a case of do complete dominance and recessivity. Okay. So this is a case where you have these you're only get, you're going to get a 50-50 ratio, okay? So one of the other things to think about, and you'll be doing this in lab, and I'll give you some homework examples. Uh, of course, this is what's the phenotypic ratio expected from this Mendelian cross? You expect half to be tall and half to be short. What about the expected uh, genotypic proportions? So exactly the same, under, usually under this sort of case, half are going to be heterozygote, half are going to be homozygous recessive. Okay. okay, let's do a clicker question. And don't pull out a paper and do Punnett square. This is out of the test bank too. This should be, I think, fairly straightforward. Let me, um, okay, 
kind of. If big R, big R flower is red, and R, R flower is pink, and R, R flower is white, <coughs> what percentage of the offspring from a cross between an RR individual and an RR individual will be red? R, big R, small r, be red. So your choices are, and remember this is not complete dominance, this is incomplete dominance. What percentage of offspring from a cross between a homozygous big R, big R, and a heterozygote individuals will be red? Your choices are A, 10%, B, 25%, C, 50%, and D, 75%. I gotta get that on. Huh? Yeah, but won't it warn again on next question when you do that? That doesn't make sense to me. Okay, well, let's see what happens the next time. Okay. And again, think about this is what's the frequency of the, you know, that you're gonna get from each one of these individuals in terms of 100% and half, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Everybody in? Easy? What do you what do you pick? Huh? Yeah, 50% is the right answer. Good. Great. Easy, right? So when you think about that, one individual produces 100% of big R, right? The other one produces 50% of big R and small r. All, and I'll be doing path, these line diagrams. You just take you know, that one times 50% and you get 50% of each. So that I'll show you how to do that instead of doing a Punnett square. Okay, so good. Let me stop, I'm gonna stop the video so, I can, so they're not so long. <laughs>